Testing, testing. All right, welcome back. CS 4510, lecture 10, uh, B. The topic of today's lecture is diagonalization. Uh, no, we don't mean matrix diagonalization, because even I get confused uh, when I see something reference diagonalization. Sometimes they mean decomposition of matrices. That's exactly, this came before that. So I think this should take priority, but I think uh, it's sort of old fashioned now. Uh, diagonalization is probably one of the most important proof techniques of the 20th century. It, is, it was foundational for basically the entire class. In some sense, this class is a class on the theory and the application of diagonalization as a, as a technique. Um, it's probably one of the most famous, uh, really, it's re really nothing more than a party trick. Um, I remember, actually, when I was a kid, I used to play this game with my dad with diagonalization. He would give me uh, a set of things, and then I would, tr he, I would try to find an ordering on them. And then he would, uh, he would beat me by always taking uh, diagonalization. That is, actually, I realize that now that doesn't make sense because I haven't explained what diagonalization is yet. But it, it's, really, it's the kind of thing that you know, children can do. It's really uh, to this level. Um, basically, what happened is Cantor, George Cantor found a proof that he was talking about, we talked a lot about cardinality of, uh, of countable sets. We talked about the naturals and all these, these variants, the rationals, okay, sigma star, all these countable sets, okay? These are all uh, countable sets, right? Um, George Cantor found a proof that the reals were actually not countable. These are uncountable. That means that the reals are strictly greater than the rationals. Excuse me, the naturals, rationals too. Strictly greater. Um, and it was upsetting to everyone. So why is this upsetting? First of all, that's an infinite set. That's an infinite set. This infinite is bigger than this infinite. That means there's two infinites. That's not good, right? That's uncomfortable, um, heretical even. Um, terrible, terrible, uh, terrible feeling, OK? What does it mean for there to be two infinities? Uh, he came up with this proof, and people didn't like it because it showed something they didn't like. So they challenged him to find a simpler and a better proof, and he came up with what we now call the diagonalization trick. And diagonalization uh, is used to prove uncountability. And, it's, and again, it's really like a parlor trick, like a cheap hack. So there's something called uh, Cantor's theorem. I hit record. Yes. Okay. Cantor's theorem basically says um, that the cardinality of a set A is always the the cardinality of the power set is always strictly greater uh, than the cardinality of the set itself. Always. Uh, this is kind of nice because it extends our idea of uh, finite sets, right? So first off, A is finite. The power set is finite. But it's a bigger finite. How many subsets of a, of a finite set are there? If the set has n elements, how many subsets of, are there? Zero to the n. Yeah. So this is like n. This is like two to the n, right? So we went, the variations of the countable sets that we proved was like. Um, so let's suppose we're going to call that the naturals have uh, cardinality, and I write it like this: a left null. And that's not how you write an Aleph, but it's a Hebrew letter, and I don't really do a good job. I think it's supposed to look like. I can't draw that, though. So we're going to use this for Aleph. The cardinality of the naturals is what we call Aleph null. Um, it seems to us, though, like uh, Aleph null uh, plus one. We'll say, we'll say plus three. Uh, three times the. Uh, Aleph null and like Aleph null uh, cubed, these are all kind of like just Aleph null, right? These all kind of have the same cardinality as the naturals. So you can add countably many, finitely many, many elements to a countably infinite set, it remains countably infinite. You can multiply, you can take three unions of countably infinite set, and you can take the Cartesian product three times, countably infinite. So it appears that. If you were to think of it as a number, it's not a number, but you think of A of null as a number, under polynomially many operations, that you get a A of null back out. 
However, how many subsets are there? So in some sense, um, 2 to the aleph null does not equal aleph null. This is a bigger function. I'm using vague words here because we're talking about infinities. 2 to the infinity is, is a bigger infinity, turns out. This is something we're going to call uh, aleph 1. This is, all these end up being just aleph null. This one is bigger. This one ends up being aleph 1. So we're going to prove today that the power set of a set is always has strictly bigger cardinality. Right? So uh, I'm going to prove, it's true actually, if A is finite, it's true if A is countably infinite. It's true even if A is uncountable. And an uncountable set is a set strictly stronger, strictly larger, with strictly larger cardinality than a countably infinite set. So an uncountable set, in some sense, is uncountable. R is bigger than the naturals, like much bigger. Um, this holds even for uncountable sets, it turns out. We're going to only prove it for the countably infinite case to demonstrate the technique. I don't care about the real numbers, even a little bit, but I care about the technique. This is an insanely important technique. It's, it's, um, so well, first, let's just do the proof, I think, and then we can talk about uh, what, what the proof means. So. Let, uh, let A be countably infinite. I already mentioned, we already mentioned why, if it's, why it's true if it's finite. 2 to the n is bigger than n always. Uh, and it does hold for the infinite, uncountable case. But let's just suppose we're going to prove the countably infinite case. Suppose A is countably infinite. So suppose A is countably infinite. Uh, assume to the contrary. The subsets of S of A are countable. So there's ca only countably many subsets of A. Okay? In another sense, what this really proves is the existence of an uncountable set. We're really given a countable set. We're, we can construct an uncountable set. We don't just have to, we could just define a countable set. And given that definition, it turns out we can construct the uncountable. Uh, so the uncountable set is not defined. It's constructed from a countable set. Um, so assume to the contrary, the subsets of A are countable. What that means is we can order uh, elements of the power set of A, which are the subsets of A, uh, like, uh, let's say, S1, S2, S3, right? If a set is countable, we can list the elements out in some order. We can suppose we can list the subsets out in some order, right? There exists an ordering of the subsets, uh, where this ordering is total. What does that mean? Uh, it's that means every subset appears somewhere in this ordering. Okay, seventeenth spot, whatever. Every subset has to appear in this ordering. This is an ordering of all of the subsets of A. Um, uh, define a set uh, D as we say, uh, well, I'll say it this way. Since uh, A is countable, order A like. Uh, a1, A2, A3, right? So we can order A, not assume to the contrary. A is countably infinite. We, we can just do that, right? Um, so we're going to define D set D like uh, AI is going to be in the set D if and only if. AI is not in set SI. And equivalently, because this is an if and only if, I'm just going to write it twice. AI is not in D if and only if AI was in SI. Same thing, right? Basically, what I'm saying is we go to the ith set in our ordering. We look if it contains AI or not. If it does, we do the opposite. Okay. 
since a D only contains elements of A, then uh, D is a subset of A. Agree? The only elements of D are AIs. So D is a subset of A. Or we could write this as D is an element of the power set of A. Uh, so D is in the ordering uh, somewhere. D is in the ordering somewhere. What that means is there exists J such that D is equal to SJ. There, we ordered all the subsets of A. D is a subset of A. D is in line. It, suppose it's in the Jth spot. J is the spot in line. It is good as number, good as a name of a variable as any other. It's in the D is in the Jth spot. D then is equal to SJ. Okay. Uh, AI. However, AI is in uh, D if and only if what? Well, D is just SJ. Excuse me. Excuse me. AJ is in D. AJ is some element, okay? Because D is because J is a number. J is the S is the Jth set. AJ is also the Jth element. AJ is in D. Well, if D equals SJ, then AJ is in D if and only if uh, AJ is in SJ. Agree? Because D is just SJ. Well, if AJ was in SJ, then AJ would not be in D. Contradiction, right? So we see that AJ is in D if and only if AJ was not in D. An element of a set cannot both be in and not in the set at the same time. So we have a contradiction. The power set of A is not countable. Have you guys seen a proof by diagonalization before? Is that the one where like they line up all the real numbers and then they just go diagonal? Exactly. The... I want to stress something about this though, uh, and we'll do a proof like that uh, today as well. A lot of people think that diagonalization involves a table, but in fact, diagonalization has nothing to do with a table. The in, in in you should get good at being able to do a proof by diagonalization without having to draw the visual picture. We'll do another proof with the visual picture, but I wanted to do one first without it. Uh, implicitly, there is a visual picture here. Why? If you think of the i, i elements of a table, we're looking at a, i, and s, i, and then we're taking the negation of it. So we're doing, in some sense, a logical uh, diagonal table flip without having to actually do draw the picture of the table. Okay? However, just the proof by itself, we've applied the diagonalization proof technique. It does all the parts of the diagonalization that we care about. It doesn't have the picture of the table, though. But you should be able to do this without the picture of the table, right? What did we do? Just to review, um, we, A is countably infinite. We assume to the contrary that the subsets of A are countable. Then or, you can order them in some order. That's really what we're breaking, the fact that you can order the elements, the, you can order the subset. You can order the subsets in some way, in a total way. That's what we're contradicting. Because we define D. D is defined quite literally, not circularly. It's explicit that you know this is not a circular proof. But D is defined on the ordering. So whatever this ordering is, you define D to be based on that ordering. right? If AI is an SI, then you explicitly eliminate AI from D. And if AI was not found in SI, so you go to the ith set, you look if its, if it's ith element is there or not. If AI was not in SI, then you have to put it in D. So in some sense, D is defined to do one thing, which is disagree with every SI on one element. D is defined only to be a disagreeing object. It is, in some sense, a non-constructive, constructed object. We've built this object D that has no purpose. It's not a useful or interesting set, except in the sense that it has to be different than every SI. 
It's different than every SI in some spot. So we assume that it was equal to some SI, some SJ, because it is a subset. It has to be somewhere in the ordering. We say, okay, you're 17th place in line. You, you're, then you're number 17. But we notice that we disagree with the 17th one on the 17th element. Right? And this is true for every element in every set. So if it disagrees with every set on at least one element, it can't be in any of the sets. So we've, we've constructed a set that is somehow a subset, yet none of the subsets. So it's somehow a subset, but not in the power set. The contradiction, that's where the contradiction lies, in the fact that we assume that the power set could be nice and naturally ordered. That's the contradiction. So this is a first flavor, first proof of a diagonalization. Any questions on this? Topic of today, by the way, I'm just going to do three diagonalization proofs. Slightly different variations, slightly different data structures on all of them. Any questions? Good? Okay. I'm going to do um, a sigma infinity, which is what? Uh, this is the set of infinite. Uh, strings, infinite length strings. So sigma star is the set of strings which terminate. It's the set of, sigma star is countable. Uh, sigma star is the set of strings which end. Each string has a length. The strings in sigma infinity are s infinite strings in some sense. They go infinitely long. I claim that sigma infinity is uncountable. So what, is, what are some elements in the string? Like 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, I don't know, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, something like this, right? Each string is infinitely long, and of course, there's infinitely many of them. Infinite, you can also say infinite binary sequences. So here's the proof, right? Assume to the contrary. Sigma infinity is countable. Order its elements like uh, x1, x2, and so on. Uh, let uh, D be an infinite uh, binary sequence, binary string. Uh, such that uh, d of i, so the ith bit of the ith string, the ith bit of d is going to be 1 minus the ith bit of the ith string. We look at the ith bit of the ith string, and here, here sigma is just going to be 0, 1, right? Look at the ith bit. Uh, of the ith string and flip it, right? So that's what d is. So certainly d is an infinitely long binary string. Certainly uh, d is in uh, sigma infinity. Why? It's an infinitely long binary string. So it has to be in sigma infinity. So there exists, so there exists J uh, such that uh, D is equal to X J, right? So if X one, X two, X three is a total ordering of the infinitely long binary strings, infinitely long binary sequences, uh, then D being an infinitely long binary sequence has to exist somewhere in that ordering. So suppose it exists at the Jth spot. But notice, though, that uh, notice that uh, d of j, the jth bit of d, is equal to the jth bit of the jth string. Why? Because d is equal to xj. Okay. But as defined, uh, d of j, using the definition of j, is equal to one minus xj of j. Contradiction. Right, we get the fact that uh, xj j is 
equal to 1 minus uh, xj. J. You cannot be 0 and 1 simultaneously. Contradiction. The reason I'm doing these proofs in this specific way is because I want to show you uh, what is a better expectation of the proof than uh, having to draw a picture. This was kind of clearly simple. Um, by picture, what we mean is like, suppose, assume to the contrary, there did exist this ordering, x1, x2, whatever. Uh, what we're going to do is write it like x1, x2, x3, that, 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 right? This is a 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, something like that. This is a 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, uh, 1, 1, 1, 0. Right? So you could, if you could arrange the elements, uh, assume to the contrary, you could arrange the elements into rows, countably, right? Uh, you assume to the contrary that sigma infinity is countably infinite, so then you can arrange them in x1, x2, x3, and so on. Then you define d basically on this table. You're going to take this diagonal of the table. and flip it. Whatever the diagonal is, you're going to flip it. So that, what that's going to look like is you're going to have uh, d here. For this specific table, is going to be 1, 0, 1, 1, like this. And the next digits of d are defined to be different uh, than the next rows of xi. Now, because d is this infinitely long binary sequence, it has to be some row in this table by your assumption that the, tor the, the ordering was total. However, D is defined explicitly to do one thing, which is disagree with every row in the table on one element. So it can't be in any row of the table. Suppose it was the, ith, the jth row in the table. Well, the jth bit of D is defined to be different than the jth row of the table. Because D is defined on the table, D is different than every row of the table. Therefore, D cannot fit in the table. So this ordering was not total, a, a contradiction. This is what's going on in the background every time you do a diagonalization proof. But the thing is, you don't have to draw this picture every time when you do the diagonalization proof. I want you to do this, to understand how it looks like logically and pictorially without, under, without having to go through the thing. Uh, two quick uh, remarks here. This implicitly does the same table. Okay? Why? Here's AI and AI. What is, a, what is the II? AI and AI here is quite literally the diagonal of a matrix. Okay? If you have an infinite table like this, the diagonal is going to be the ii entries. So here's where the i and the i come in for that. Where does the negation come in? We say this element is in it when it's not in it, or it's not in it when it's in it. That is, you know, that is a sort of a logical negation. Here we've done infinite binary string, but we could have done uh, sets as well, right? So in some sense, that's, that, 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 the proof with the sets is the logical negation. When this is like an actual negation, you make the 1 is the 0 and the 0 is the 1. Okay. Any questions on these two proofs so far? Cool. Um, one more uh, quick remark here. Did you guys notice that these two objects are kind of the same? So we proved what? We proved that both the power set of a countable set, I'll just call it the naturals for now, and uh, sigma infinity are both uncountable. But I claim that there exists a bijection between these two, and that would have been sufficient for us to prove uncountability. uncountability. Um, what is a bijection from between sets of naturals and infinitely long binary strings? Again, the, subs the subsets of the naturals can implicitly be infinitely, so infinitely sized subsets. Strings are all infinitely long. What is a bijection between? Can we find a bijection from? sets to uh, strings, infinitely long strings. Yes? If you use a typewriter. Ah, so we can't use a typewriter principle here. Why? The typewriter principle says it has a unique finite terminating string. These are infinite strings. And the, the typewriter principle can only be used to prove that a set is countable. It takes too much work to show, it's, to show a set is uncountable using it, so we just don't say that. Um, the answer I'm looking for is really is the characteristic, uh, the characteristic um, string, right? You guys know what a characteristic string is. So, like, uh, uh, if like 
Well, we said we said this was naturals, right? So we're like, uh, if uh, I is in some subset S, which is a subset of the naturals, then you say the characteristic string x i, x of S, has uh, the ith bit equal one. So you make each digit of the string be a one or a zero, whether or not the ith element is in the set or not. So some characteristic strings real quick, like the empty set characteristic, the characteristic string of the empty set is going to be what? Zero, 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 right? The characteristic string of the naturals is going to be what? One, 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 all right? The characteristic string of the evens is going to be what? One, zero, one, zero. Yes, zero is even, so we have to start there. So this is one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, right? Infinitely long, right? So this is the bijection. Certainly, two seek. This is certainly bijective. Why? If two strings were the same, uh, then the set has to contain, the two sets have to contain exactly the same elements. If two sets contain the same elements and only the same elements, then, then they have to be the same set. So certainly, this is a bijection between these two. All right, let's do one more diagonalization proof. Finally, I want to prove, um, you know, part of this starting crisis in mathematics uh, is that the reals are uncountable. One way you could do this is you could find a bijection between uh, the reals and the power set of the naturals, which has size strictly greater than the naturals themselves. Those have the same card. Those two sets have the same cardinality. Instead, we're going to do a, proceed by a proof of diagonalization. But instead of diagonalizing over the whole reals, we're going to diagonalize over the interval uh, zero comma one. Okay. And this is going to be a subset of the reals. And proving that a set has an uncountable subset is sufficient to showing a set is uncountable. Okay. By the way, uh, what is, is there a bijection between the 0, 1 interval and all of the real numbers? Yes. What is the bijection? It's not easy to find, but there is a kind of a stretching rubber band technique that works for uncountable continuous objects and not really discrete ones. So the 0, 1 interval to all the real numbers? Yes. We can even suppose, let's just start with the positive reals. What if you just have like any number equal like two times that number or like so two times this interval would give you zero, oh, to, zero two. to two but if you just keep stretching that ah so you couldn't you can't say infinite times the set though so that wouldn't work here's I th I think it's one over oh one over that value uh, r minus one. Or is it 1 minus r? r is 0. We're going to stretch the end of this interval to the point 0, and we're going to stretch the 0 to the other interval, right? Wait, it's so something like this. You basically, there's as many real numbers in the 0, 1 interval as this one at the very end? Here. This? And then 1 minus r? So 1 over 1 minus r. 1 over 1 minus r minus 1. Yeah. That is a bijection you're claiming. So if r is 0, this is going to be 1 over, this is going to be 0. Yeah. If r is 1, 
this is going to this limit is going to go to infinity and it's going to be in, in, in infinity ish minus one close enough that's certainly going to this is certainly a, this is certainly then a bijection from uh, to the positive reals this wouldn't include any oh positive reals okay. yes so this takes zero comma one to uh, the positive reals bijectively and then of course you can do the same thing. You can go from the positive reals to all the reals. There's a similar stretching rubber band trick. Continuous objects, uncountable objects sets are very different than uh, discrete ones. You can't do this with the naturals at all, right? In some sense, the 0, 1 interval is a rubber band as stretchy as the whole, whole, whole real line. So you can just stretch the whole, you literally, quite literally stretch the interval over the whole real line and you get it and you're done there, okay? Uh, the, the other reason I'm doing this uh, this way is because did you guys know and maybe you've done maybe you have that 0 0.999 uh, repeating is equal to 1 have you guys seen this trick there's two proofs it's equal to 1 well what is 1 minus 0 0.999 and this is an infinite it never terminates right well 1 minus 0 0.99999 is equal to 0 0.000 also never term terminating and that of course is just 0 and if the difference between two numbers is zero, then they're, the, then they're equal. So the, the number one actually has two different decimal representations. Um, similarly, uh, you could do like a 0 0.999 is equal to one third times 0 0.3333, right? Would you agree we could pull out a three? Okay, uh, what is this though? Wait, no, this we can pull out a three. 0 0.3333 is just one third. Zero point nine 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 is equal to um, one. So I'm excluding three and a third is equal to one. Oh, three times one third. Oh yes. my bad. Yeah. So how would you assume we're going to do the diagonalization over the, the, the interval zero one? To the natural numbers, or I'm asking you to diagonalize out of the interval zero one, oh. the open interval zero one. Can't you just put it into a graph like that, and then just change one digit on each number? Yes, exactly. We're going to put it into a table, basically. Change the ith each uh, each number has a decimal representation. So let's just do the proof logically first. Uh, assume to the contrary. Uh, zero one interval is countable. So order its elements. Like uh, we'll say R one, R two, right? Uh, define a number D as Zero point, uh, we'll say D1, D2, D3, uh, dot, 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 where uh, DI is equal to ith digit of RI plus one uh, mod 10, right? So basically, we're just adding one to every digit of ri. And if we add a zero, we want to wrap around. We don't want to add, if we were at nine, we don't want to be 10, nine plus 10, and we want that to go to zero, right? So just every digit of di is supposed to be different than a digit of ri. Uh, certainly, a d uh, is a decimal number. less than or equal to one. So uh, uh, D is in uh, zero comma one. And it's also greater than zero, obviously. I guess I have to say it. Uh, so uh, there exists uh, J uh, such that 
D is equal to RJ. If R, I, R1, R2, R3 is the total ordering of the real numbers inside the 0, 1 interval, then, and D is a number inside the 0, 1 interval, then certainly D has to exist somewhere in that ordering, and we'll just suppose it exists at the jth spot. But uh, a digit J of D, which is what we're calling DJ, um, dj is equal to rj plus 1 mod 10. And as defined, uh, Say it this way. Well, DJ is supposed to be uh, the jth digit of RJ, but DJ is also equal to a jth digit of RJ um, plus one uh, mod ten. So the date J. Jth digit can never be both rj and rj plus 1 mod 10. Those two numbers will never be equal. So a contradiction. If we were to draw this in a table, suppose we had 0 0.111273, 0 0.71892, something like this. These are all the decimals. Every real number has some decimal expansion. Uh, and all the ones that are in the 0, 1 interval begin with a 0. We can say, I don't know, 8, 3, 4, dot, 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 something like this. Suppose we can order these, these numbers like this, right? Well, then we're defining D quite literally to be 0 0.2, 2, 5, dot, 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 right? So as defined, D cannot exist in... Uh, the table, because it's defined exactly and explicitly to be different than every uh, element in the table, right, by some digit. Since it differs from every element in the table by one digit, it can't be anywhere in the table. Uh, and we've, we have a contradiction. Uh, the, the, the interval 0, 1 is not countable. Any questions on this proof? Uh, so. I, I want to lead you guys on with a question. Are all countable, uh, do all uncountable sets have the same cardinality? Why? Because for the weird n, you had a 0, 1, and I would assume that there are higher levels. Yes. So notationally, the syntax gave it away. You know, sometimes if there's two different definitions of something, then they're going to be called different things. So like they're called different things for a reason. Otherwise, people would call like we call the regular languages. They're all regular, right? So, um, the idea is like Cantor has the proof that the, that the power set is always strictly stronger than the set. You can recursively apply this, and you can get the fact that the power set, the power set of the power set, must have stricter cardinality uh, greater than the, the set itself. So the set of set of subsets of a the set of subsets of the set of subsets of a countable set has to have cardinality greater than the set of subsets of a countable set. This is what we would call um, A of 2. A of 0, 1. Okay, yeah. In practice, we don't really care. I mean, if you're beyond uncountability, I mean, what kind of, what kind of what math are you doing if you're talking about enumerating the subsets of the real numbers. You're already really beyond anything that we could really care about. You're really out there, maybe like a topological space or something, but it, it's beyond us, really. The countable and uncountable is good enough a distinction as we care, because in computer science, uh, we care about the countable, and mathematics, all this other stuff, we care about the uncountable. Okay, so I mentioned that we were going to develop this entire theory of mathematics to prove one theorem. So let's prove that one theorem.
Uh, so let uh, LTM be the recognizable languages. So do you guys recall the definition of LTM? I've given conflicting definitions, so I want to make sure this is solid. LTM is the class of languages. Uh, so like L is in uh, LTM, the recognizable languages, if there exists a Turing machine M uh, such that uh, for all uh, W in sigma star uh, that M on W halts and accepts uh, if and only if W was an L and M on W I'll just say accepts and M on W rejects or loops if and only if uh, W is not an L. So basically, if the answer is supposed to be correct, the machines, the Turing machine says yes. If the answer is supposed to be wrong, the Turing machine can say no, but we also allow it to plead the fifth. So it's allowed to loop when it's wrong. Um, this is the definition of the class of uh, recognizable or recursively enumerable uh, uh, languages. Countable or uncountable? LTM is countable or uncountable? This one's not easy. Let's see if we can get this. assume uncountable. Why? I might be misunderstanding, but I feel like because sigma, uh, sigma star is infinite, that... So first, I guess, you, let's, do, let's do what you're saying first, actually. So how many languages are there, right? L is a subset of uh, uh, sigma star. How many subsets of sigma star are there? Two to the Star. What is that? Two. So Two we're saying three. that the, the what is the cardinality of the power set of the sigma a sigma star? Sigma star countable. So yes. it would be like an uncountable set. Yes. Like proven. By Cantor's theorem, we can quickly say the power set of an accountably infinite set has to be uncountable. So this is uncountable. Okay. But uh, I claim that LTM is countable, right? Why is LTM countable? Well, uh, each Turing machine recognizes some language. Perhaps two Turing machines recognize the same language. So there are more Turing machines recognizable languages. Each Turing machine recognizes some language. Two Turing machines may recognize the same language. So the number of Turing machines, the number of Turing machines is greater than the cardinality of LTM. There's, of course, obviously infinitely many Turing machines, right? Just like there's infinitely many code programs. It just, um, why, how many Turing machines are there, though? So it's infinite, certainly. Countable or uncountable? You think there's uncountably many Turing machines. So it's actually countable. But why? Using the tools we've known from the last lecture, why is uh, the number of Turing machines countable? 
is because it's a subset of everything that's computable. And there are only a finite amount of things that are computable. Or I guess there are. You know, yeah. So I guess the answer I'm looking for is the typewriter principle. By the typewriter principle, every Turing machine is a unique description. If two Turing machines have the same description, they're the same Turing machine. QED. So uh, there's less recognizable languages. OK, the recording shut off. I ran out of disk space on this computer, but I just wanted to finish the argument here. Basically, uh, just for, for the sake of the video, basically, every Turing machine uh, recognizes some language. Okay. But not every, and in fact, two Turing machines may recognize um, the same language, right? You could have two pieces of code which are slightly syntactically different, yet they do the same thing. They, the language that the Turing machine recognizes is a semantic property, but the Turing machines themselves may be syntactically different. You can insert tabs or whatever, or even different logic control flow may be equivalent. So the number of Turing machines, though, there are more Turing machines than there are recognizable languages. Because each Turing machine recognizes some language. And in fact, two Turing machines may recognize the same language. Shh, fine, OK? The number of Turing machines, however, is countable. Because each Turing machine has a finite description. And each Turing machine has a, is a string representation. By the typewriter principle, there's only finitely many Turing machines. So there's only finitely many recognizable languages. However, uh, since sigma star is countable, the power set of sigma star is uncountable by Cantor's theorem. The number of countable, the number of languages, is uncountable. However, each language is count, each language itself is a countable set. Sure, but each, the set of the number of possible subsets, is uh, uncountable. So there are uncountably many languages, but there are only countably many which are recognizable. Here's the the reason this is important. For each Turing machine really corresponds to each Turing machine a, a solver for some problem. It, each Turing machine is an algorithm. It does something. It solves some problem. In some sense, the number of languages are the number of possible problems. So by showing that there's only countably many solvers, only countably many solutions, yet uncountably many problems, we've shown that there are more problems than there are solutions, like in general, not for Turing machines or anything, but in all of uh, uh, as a theory of computation, there are more problems to be solved than there are solutions to solve those problems. There's no course, there cannot exist a correspondence between the solutions and the problems. So that means this is, cannot be surjective. This map can't be surjective, and there has to exist problems which are themselves unsolvable. There exist unprob unsolvable problems. This is Turing's first uh, argument, like in, uh, in favor of the problem he solves, which we'll talk about next time. But he's, he uses a simple counting argument here to, to display the fact that there are unsolvable uh, problems. We'll talk about some concrete unsolvable problems uh, next time, hopefully. Diagonalization in general is a historic and important technique. It's really famous, it's really popular, and it's very important. And it's, it even makes uh, people uncomfortable. Like the whole thing is founded on the idea that you can talk about uh, the cardinality of the naturals anyway. right? which is not necessarily fully agreed upon and welcomed. So you talk about the naturals. We're talking about this. So it is understood that the naturals are not really a set to some people. These are nothing more than the outcome of an iterative process. How do you build the naturals? You start with the element 0, and then you repeatedly apply the function of the successor. So you take s x equals x plus 1. And if you were to do this infinitely, you would build the naturals. But it's not thought that the Naturals are themselves a set, and it makes no sense to talk about the size of an infinite process because the process doesn't finish. So it's controversial that you can do this. It was at least at the time, historically, and it made very many, many people angry and uncomfortable. Um, now we know that Cantor's right, and it's pretty much agreed upon. It's not certain what it means to be what the size of an object, uh, uh, the size of a process is that never completes, right? So it was thought that only really size and things you could only talk about with respect to finite sets. So the fact that you could do cardinality, uh, you can generalize your argument to say that there are, quote unquote, more reals than there are naturals, right? That there are more subsets of a set than there are elements in the set itself. Even if the set is infinite, it feels like it's, you're 
you know, peeking beyond the veil. Like you're looking at something you're not allowed to in some sense. And um, today, at least, it's, it's, it's very well agreed upon that the logic is sound. Uh, but it is an uncomfortable argument, uh, certainly, which is why I wanted to stress diagnosis itself as a technique. It's very important. You know, you, there are three really important parts of a diagnosis technique every single time. You have some sort of diagonal ish looking thing. You look at the ith element of the ith row and the ith column or whatever. So there's like an ii kind of thing going on. Uh, you take some sort of a negation. And then that's itself the diagonal. And then you construct this non-constructive object whose, whose only job is, exists is to disagree. You can do it over different data structures. We did it over uh, the real interval. We did it over the set of subsets. We did it over infinitely long binary strings. Over whatever subset structure you have, you take the negation, and you're done. That's your contradiction there. And that's really what diagonalization is about. It is not circular. It is not a circular proof technique. But it is, uh, very importantly, it is self-referential. There is a distinction to be made, because circular proofs are not correct. You can't have circular logic. But you can have self-referential logic. And the diagonal is usually defined on the ordering itself, which you assumed existed. Um, if you had a different ordering, of course, you have a different diagonal. Okay.